Super. Take That's it away. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yes, you're welcome. Happy to be here. Maria Royal with Legislative Council. And so uh, what I thought I would do for you today uh, is first just provide an overview of the Vermont Universal Service Fund, uh, its purpose, how it's financed, the programs it supports, and then touch upon some legal developments that might impact future contributions to the fund. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Federal Universal Service Fund. And then uh, the hope was that when Clay arrives, he can give you the most recent data in terms of the money that's in the fund and how much has gone to the programs in the last fiscal year. Um, does that make yep. sense? Yep, Okay, great. So uh, the fund, the Vermont Fund, was established in 1994. And its purpose by statute is to create a financial structure that will allow every Vermont household to obtain basic telecommunication service at an affordable price. So you might wonder what is basic telecommunication service? That also is defined in statute. And I won't read through each of these definitions, but basically it means that it's capable of voice quality service, voice service. You can originate or uh, terminate, receive a telephone call. Um, it goes through the public switch telephone network. That's basically the network of all the telephone exchanges in the world. Um, it's capable of being routed uh, through all of those network interconnections. It has the ability to transmit data. Um, and also, uh, number four, it has the ability to communicate quickly and effectively with emergency personnel. And finally, uh, it includes the telecom relay service, which is a service for the hearing impaired. So those are all the elements of basic telecommunication service that by statute should be available to all Vermonters at an affordable price. So how is the fund financed? Um, there is a, we've talked about this already, so I know it's somewhat review, but there's a proportional charge on all telecommunications transactions that interact with the public switch network. And in 2014, that rate of charge was set as a flat 2%. Before that time, it was capped at 2%, but it was variable. The public, then public service board would set the rate based on how much uh, they needed to fund the programs. And it was usually around 1.5% somewhere. Um, but in 2014, they increased and then set it at a flat 2%. And also, it's worth noting that that is, the rate is only applied to retail telecommunication service, so any wholesale transactions, so if there are any between the, comp the telephone companies, intercarrier, interconnection, access charges in the wholesale market, not to the end user or the consumer, the wholesale market, this, this surcharge does not apply. Good. I just speak purely on the consumer transaction? Yes. Yeah. And one other question I sure. have there, and, and maybe it's um, uh, it's self-evident, uh, the public switch network. Yes. So it's basically uh, the local exchange networks on a global level. So there are many different providers, and it's transmitted over many different types of uh, medium, whether it's cable, whether it's wireless. But it's that connection of telephone systems, usually associated with the 10-digit telephone number different from, for example, uh, if you used a service over the internet, I'm thinking of like Skype, or an application like that where you can communicate with people throughout the world, but it's all over the um, internet. Mm -hmm. There's an IP address, they have an, an IP address. At no point do you interact with or can you call somebody at a 10-digit phone number. Some applications allow you to do that, like WhatsApp. Um, you can download programs where you're mobile, you have an application, and it allows you to make a telephone call to somebody in the state house, use the 10-digit number. So that's significant because for those uh, providers that just have that IP address to IP address, they're not covered here at all. 
um, but for other VoIP, voice over internet, um, they would be covered if you can send or receive a call from a local exchange number. Does that make sense? Okay. How, do you, how do you know um, whether a call is a VoIP call or a regular type of call? in order to charge that? Or is the universal service fee based on the charges for the, serve, uh, you know, the, the uh, public switch network service? I, I, I guess I don't understand how, how, the, how the USF is applied to those types of calls that you just described coming yeah. from the IP address to a, yeah, so I think you're, you're raising a really interesting issue that I'm trying to get a handle on myself um, because I think it's the companies that basically keep track of the information. You, the consumer, might not necessarily know you pick up your phone, you don't know how they're contacting right. you, but the companies um, analyze their data and they're required to, um, but it's not clear to me and not being an engineer anyway, how they keep track of the traffic and know when somebody is just usually using a purely data call or when they're actually interacting with the public switch network. Um, I think there are ways that they're able to do that, but I'd have to you know, follow, do a little bit more research. Because it's not always billed separately either, and that sometimes is a problem. Sometimes VoIP service might be included in a package, mm -hmm. but there isn't a separate charge. So I think these are all kind of developing, unfolding technologies and how the USF is applied to them is not <laughs> perfectly clear, at least not to me. I don't want to get stuck on this too long, but I, I, you don't get charged for a, for a Skype call, for example, or, or, right. or for a call from, um, from your computer to attend to phone number, right? I mean, there's no way to, there's no way to charge for that. For that. I don't know the answer to that, okay, right, right. and that's. I think that goes to like it might be bundled in with your data package, and I don't know how, to the extent that the provider itself keeps track of that. It it needs to pay both the state and the unit, the federal USF fund, so they have to do some kind of data analysis or traffic studies, and how they do that, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and some of it I know for. For example, for wireline, um, and this is just by extrapolation, for wireline calls, about 60, on average, about 64% of calls are interstate. So at the federal level, when they apply the federal universal service charge to uh, wireless or VoIP providers, they can either, the provider can either do the traffic analysis and say, this is how many interstate calls we've had, or there's a safe harbor provision where they can say, about 64% of our calls are interstate, so we'll apply a surcharge to 64. So I think there's some recognition that it isn't, might not be spot on. There might be the capability, but if not, then you just go with the 64%, which is roughly equivalent to what the wire line. Does that make sense? I know it's. Sure. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I, I don't want to stay. Seth, did you have a question? Then, uh, okay, uh, and if you can clarify any of this, please do. <laughs> uh, question, Maria. The, so I think of this as the 2% the charge on my phone bill, mm -hmm. but it, it also applies to prepaid calling cards, right? Yes. Does it apply to anything else besides our phone bill and calling cards? Uh, well, we're, there's a slide we're going to go through <coughs> that will list all the things it applies to. But it's it's pretty much 2% on your phone call to the extent it's a telecom service. So, um, but we'll get to that. I think it might answer that question. Uh, and just for reference, in 2017, this is just the most recent um, data that I have, $6.2 million was raised by this finance charge. And so um, we've kind of already touched on this, but again, the charge is applied to retail telecom service. Um, this is basically the definition of statute. Um, and it's essentially anything that interacts, transmission of information that interacts with the public switch network, 
um, transmission of voice, image data, any other information over any combination of media or the leasing of any such media for such service, uh, but significantly not information services. And so that is similar to the dichotomy under the Communications Act of telecom services and unregulated information services like broadband internet access services. So, uh, um, not looking for an answer on this because maybe we need an engineer to, to get through this, but um, to the point that Mike was making, if from my VoIP phone line, and I pick up the line and I've got dial tone, um, but I'm calling through EC Fiber. EC Fiber is my um, is my telephone carrier, if you will. And I call uh, Seth on, uh, on his consolidated line, because I'm sure he's got consolidated. <laughs> um, um, I'm presuming that my call um, goes over copper at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and here in the slide, you know, we're essentially referring to um, transmission of any interactive electromagnetic communications that pass through the public switch network. So even though I've got my VoIP EC fiber phone uh, that has a dial tone, um, when I reach um, when I reach Seth on his copper uh, consolidated communications line, I'm presuming at some point my fiber call hits copper. Yeah. Um, though I'm not paying <laughs> paying um, any USF charge um, through uh, through EC Fiber. Right. So th that's not entirely clear to me. Uh, I mean, I, I know why that is, but yes. um, yeah. <laughs> but I'm taking advantage of um, copper in order to get to Seth, right. even though um, I'm not supporting the um, that infrastructure. The percentage isn't applied to that call on your bill, yeah. and. That's something I, I definitely need to research more for VoIP. I just don't know. And, and I understand that, that um, you know we're we're preempted from the Telecommunications mm -hmm. Act from uh, from applying USF to that type of information service. Right. But um, nonetheless, I am yes. taking advantage of copper infrastructure out there yes. because USF is saddled with that infrastructure. Yes. <laughs> well, but that list includes optic fiber. What's that? Now, this includes optic fiber. So it's a wire, electric conductor cable, optic fire, fiber, microwave, radio wave. Yeah. So why wouldn't it apply to EC fiber if they're providing folks? It, well, it does apply. It does apply. It does apply. But yeah. how that charge is, the VoIP providers are required to make a 2%, apply a 2% charge to their VoIP calls. Okay. I, I don't know how. That money, you know, that's kind of where I was getting to the, there are some safe harbor provisions. I just don't know how I'll, they collect I'll have to look it. more closely if I <laughs> There's, just, if I may, there's a, a reason why if you look at your Comcast bill, for yeah. example, you might see $80 for TV services or internet and then $3 for voice because then they're only paying 2% on that $3 instead of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so EC Fiber might do the same, or if you've got, you know, unlimited calling for ten bucks, then two percent is only twenty cents. Yeah. Um, but they build in the cost of that unlimited calling to your overall one hundred and fifty dollar a month bill. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't. Want, I don't want to beat this to death. But. Yeah. No. It's. <laughs> I find it complicated. I have actually tried to get a handle on that issue, and I just have not yet been able to. So um, I think Representative Chestnut Tangerman, this goes to the question you asked earlier, what are telecom services? Uh, they include, and this is under statute, local telephone service, toll telephone service, directory assistance, um, two-way cable television service, which to be perfectly honest, I did not know that was in there until yesterday, and I'm not sure what that was intended to capture. Um, you know, again, th and that was included in 1994, so I'm trying to think back at that time what this was applicable to. Um, I know there was some <coughs> interactive television uh, at that time. Um, obviously, it's not cable modem service, data service. That would be an information service. So that's just something I need to understand a little bit better myself. 
Um, then mobile telephone service, uh, your cellular service, and that includes text messaging. And then also to um, Representative Chestnut Tangerman's uh, point that he raised earlier, it applies to both postpaid and prepaid. So if you get a prepaid calling card, um, the calculation and payment of the surcharge is a little bit different. I think we've talked about this already. The wireless providers, um, they don't, it's, it's a prepaid card, and so what they are required to do is follow a formula that was set by the Public Utility Commission, um, which basically says how much revenue do you do in the state, in Vermont, uh, and send us 2% of that. So, uh, because they are not directly necessarily dealing with the consumer, and the consumer might go to a Walmart or a convenience store and buy the Verizon card, so it's a little bit of a different approach. It's not the charge isn't directly on the consumer. They could pass it on to consumers in other ways, but it's not a billing line item. And then uh, we've already talked about uh, it also applies to VoIP services that interconnect with the public switch network. And this is, we, we talked about this, and one of the reasons why um, I did want to focus a little bit on interconnected VoIP services is because that's a little bit of a developing issue. There has been a long-standing debate and uh, open questions about interconnected VoIP and whether it's an information service or telecom service under federal law. There was a recent case, I believe it was in the Eighth Circuit, uh, where this uh, issue came up and the Eighth Circuit held that uh, interconnected VoIP is an information service. And so I think the concern that some people have is uh, what does this mean if they're right? Is the FCC going to now define interconnected VoIP as an information service? And in doing so, would they no longer be subject to the state universal service fund charge? I'll just say that even if the FCC defines interconnected VoIP as an information service, it's not a done deal. They could still say for purposes of the federal and the, and the state universal service fund, they have to pay the charge. But it's something that has a lot of people concerned because if they do no longer contribute to the fund, that could be a, uh, an issue in terms of long-term sustainability of the fund. You want to keep going? You want to get no, through it? I, my well, question. Well, uh, with respect to the prepaid uh, calling cards, uh, yeah, with respect to the, what was it going to ask? I forgot. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great answer. Yeah, I know you did. My best one. I was really counting on you. <laughs> uh, Maria, do you know what the percentage um, uh, of the it's total, yeah. I don't. That's part of the information Clay is going to provide oh, when yeah. he comes in here by category of each He's provider. Here. He's tucked in the corner hiding. Oh, he is here. Yeah. <coughs> I actually didn't come prepared with that information. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll get that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Clay. No, I remember my question. <laughs> is it, are previous filing cards subject to the sales tax? I believe so. Yes. I mean, yeah, sure, I think that was yeah. Initially, they weren't, but then there was a change in the law. Short clarifying question: Interconnected means interconnected with the telephone network, not yes. In, not. Okay. So. Yes. So you can either make a call to the telephone network, or you can receive a call from the yeah, telephone you. network. So now, in terms of the programs that are supported <coughs> by the Vermont Universal Service Fund, there's the telecom relay service, service for hearing impaired, the lifeline program, uh, which is uh, basically assistance for low income eligible households, uh, E911, which is the biggest um, recipient of funds, I think of the 6.2 million last year, I think about, I, I'm, I might be wrong, probably wrong, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.8 million went to E911. Telecom Relay, Lifeline, you know, somewhere about no more than 200,000 each. Uh, 
Um, and then any remaining funds after those three programs are funded fall into what's known as the connectivity fund. That fund then funds two separate programs, the high cost program and the connectivity initiative. And we'll talk about each of those. I know we've talked about some of this already, but hopefully this will help kind of pull it together. So in terms of the high cost program, interestingly, um, when the BUSF was enacted in 1994, there wasn't a high cost program, but in statute there was a study to look at how uh, rural voice service can be subsidized in the high cost areas. It was not until 2012 that the first high cost program actually was um, enacted in session law. And I think that was capped at $1 million. But then two years later, uh, the existing high cost program was codified. And its purpose, as you can see in that little blue box, if you can read it, is to keep basic telecom service affordable in all places of Vermont and to support access to broadband service in all parts of Vermont. So it, reflect the shift, it reflected the shift that was happening at the federal level um, between the high cost program to the Connect America Fund, where subsidies for broadband build out were included, not just voice. So in terms of the high cost program requirements and um, who is eligible, uh, these are subsidies that are available to designated Vermont eligible telecommunications carriers. And I address that a little bit more on the next page. But basically, these are companies that are eligible to receive uh, federal support under the Universal Service Fund. So if they're able to meet the obligations of providing service, according to the federal programs, and they're willing to advertise and do the public <laughs> outreach, uh, then they can be deemed by the Public Utility Commission as an eligible telecommunications carrier. They're required to provide, as we mentioned earlier, both voice and broadband, and the minimum speed that they have to roll out is 4-1. Is that a statutory requirement? Yep. In other words, it can be changed. Yes. Uh, the money can only be used for capital improvements in high cost areas. And I have another slide which will look more at what a high cost area is. Um, but just before getting there, uh, the company, if they receive a subsidy, they must serve all locations in a high-cost area within five years. There is a waiver provision um, for broadband. If it's not economically feasible to build out to every single location in a high-cost area, they can uh, apply to uh, use an alternate build-out plan, which the Public Utility Commission has to approve. It is a location defined as E911. I'm pretty sure it is. I have to double check that, but that's usually uh, whether it's a residential uh, household or business. But usually it's an E911 address. Excuse me. Just, did you say that if, if it's not economically feasible, they have to provide an alternative? Yeah. They can provide, they, they can ask for one, they can petition the board. Okay. And I think that within the first year, if they realize with half of the money that we receive, we can't build broadband out to every single location, they can petition the board for, for approval to build out to however many they think they can and see if they get approval to do that. And in terms of the amount of the subsidy, uh, by statute, they're entitled to their pro rata share of available funds based on the number of ILECs in Vermont and either lines in service or service locations, whichever is greater. So uh, the bigger the company you are, uh, the more money you're entitled to under this <coughs> program. If a company chooses not to receive the subsidy, uh, their portion, their share, goes into the connectivity initiative, the broadband grant program. So it's removed from this program. It doesn't go to one of the ILECs under uh, 
the high cost program, it goes to the connectivity initiative. And then also there is a provision uh, that says there should not be any competitive overbuilds of existing wired telecom services. So making sure that the money is going where it's most needed. Maria, um, yep. could you uh, could you explain the second to the last bullet point? Yep. Um, maybe even using a hypothetical as to um, how that math would be done. So there are um, how many ILEX in Vermont? I think there are nine, if I'm not mistaken, eight independents and uh, consolidated, uh, which is an, an RBOC. Um, so there are nine companies in Vermont. Um, you would divide that money based on how many lines in service We'll just go with the lines in service each company has. So Consolidated, by far the largest, has X number of lines in service, um, whereas one of the smaller telecoms only has a, you know, yeah. a few amount. So let's say so Consolidated they're, they're is going to get a much 000. bigger share yeah. than the smaller companies. Somebody else has 20,000. Yeah. So that means that Consolidated would have um, <laughs> access to <laughs> 10 times the amount that a smaller item yes. would have. But um, maybe uh, we should go there. That doesn't mean all of consolidated, and I don't mean to be with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> service ter territory is eligible, um, would, can, would uh, meet the definition of a high cost area. Okay. So they don't automatically get money for their entire service territory. Yeah. It has to be a high cost area, and it might be helpful to look at what meets the definition of a high cost area. So the lines in service, based on lines in service, is that lines of service in a high cost area, or is that total? Um, I think it's total. I think it's total, but I need to check that again. <coughs> if somebody else in the room wants to, okay. with the permission of the chair, respond, that's yeah. helpful. Well, I, I don't mean to drag us into that. I just wanted yep. to generally have a yes. sense as the proportionality here. Okay. So, we already talked about what a Vermont ETC, and again, it needs to be designated as a VETC by the Public Utility Commission. But so, in order to qualify as a high cost area, it has to be a Vermont telephone exchange served by one of the ILEX. And then, significantly, um, the supported services that is supported by this program, the voice and the 4-1 broad broadband, are not available to all locations in the exchange from at least two service providers. If you do have the option of getting these services, broadband, 4-1, and voice, from two other service <coughs> providers, whoever they are, um, at any one location in the exchange, then it does not qualify as a high cost area. So the two ser at least two service providers, uh, raises a question in my mind. You've got the ILEC, that's one service provider. Okay. And since those territories are defined by the Public Utility Commission and they're exclusive to each ILEC, the other service provider would have to, would be something like uh, Comcast or? Yep, the CLEX, the Competitive Local Exchange okay. Carriers. <coughs> the so it could be oh, the okay. cable company fiber wireless you're able to have okay. it for one. Yeah. All right. And I don't know enough to know how many high cost areas there are in the state. Um, I just don't know. So in terms of the, uh, what's also sometimes called the broadband grant program, the connectivity initiative, the second program, and I, I didn't say this earlier, um, but the money that goes into the connectivity fund, 65% of that money goes to high cost. Let me just double check and make sure I'm not confusing that, sorry. No, I'm glad I checked. 45% uh, goes into the high cost program and 55% goes into the connectivity initiative. Unless one of the ILEX waves the... Yes, yep, good point. So in ter the requirements of the connectivity initiative, well, first of all, the purpose of the program is to provide each service location broadband 
broadband internet access service bias um, that is capable of speeds of 10.1, at least 10.1, or whatever the Connect America Fund phase two requirements are. And right now they are also 10.1. Uh, but if they go up, then the statute would go up to whatever the federal standards are for their, their broadband grant program. Um, by statute, priority is to be given to unserved and underserved locations, and those terms are defined as unserved means you only have access to dial-up or satellite service. Underserved means you have access to broadband that's faster than dial-up or satellite, but less than 4.1. And then uh, there's also a requirement that any services that are funded must be capable of being continuously upgraded to reflect best available, most economically feasible service capabilities. So just um, in terms of how that, the connectivity initiative is implemented, uh, Department of Public Service annually publishes a list of eligible census blocks, um, then solicits uh, RFPs um, from any provider. Uh, when DPS is looking at the uh, proposals that have come in, it is required to give priority to proposals that reflect the lowest cost of providing service to unserved and underserved locations um, I think the thinking being the lowest cost will reach the most people, basically, that the dollars will go the furthest. And then uh, the department also considers data transfer rates, price, the cost to consumers of any new construction or equipment or installations, um, whether the service is the best available technology that is economically feasible, the availability of service of comparable quality and speed, presumably in the area, and also the objectives of the telecom plan. Um, <clears throat> can you clarify eligible census block? And in my understanding, up, up at the top, it's a, it's a federal designation. Is that right? Or the census blocks? The are census federal. blocks are federally determined. And the eligibility is that if, if one address is served, the Block is served, or can you uh, clarify that? I don't know. I think Clay would have to weigh in on that. I don't know if it's every location in a census block, um, or if they can uh, cross borders with other census blocks. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it has to be the entire. I can find that out myself. Um, you may be able to get an answer <coughs> sooner. And then just generally for the, the Vermont Universal Service Fund, um, just for background purposes, and maybe I should have put this at the beginning, but in terms oh. of how it's administered, yes. Sorry, did we, I thought we were, you know, can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> um, uh, so the Connectivity Initiative funds, you know if you said this, but I missed it, uh, what portion of the cost of providing the service? You see what I'm It's an incentive program for uh, for <coughs> providers to, to build out their service. Yep. How much is it? It's a grant, and I don't know. I don't know um, how much they need to match, or I don't know what kind of proposals they get. So, but I can find that out also. So uh, the fund is overseen by the Department of Public Service, who hires a fiscal agent uh, to collect and distribute the funds. I think that agent right now is a firm called Solix. Um, the charge, and this kind of gets to some of the issues that came up earlier, is, uh, is uh, imposed on the person purchasing the service, um, the customer, the end user, but it's collected by the telecom provider. And again, there's that one exception for prepaid wireless. Um, 
cards that might be purchased at a Walmart. One thing that I wanted to note there is Congress passed a federal law last year, the Wireless Telecom Tax and Fee Collection Fairness Act of 2018. I think that collection method that we have in Vermont might be preempted by this federal law. So there may be a hole created simply by act of the congressional action. And so whether you want to address that or not is something for the committee to consider. No, I just, well, I think we have a bill. You do have a bill, yes. Addresses. Yep, that would apply the charge at the point of sale. So at the Walmart or the convenience store, we buy the card. Uh, payments and supporting documents are provided to the fiscal agent monthly and uh, if the provider does not uh, get their payments into the fiscal agent, there are some penalties for delinquent payments. So I only have one slide on the Federal Universal Service Fund. It could be many, many, many slides, but I just wanted you to have it in the background so um, you're less likely to conflate the two programs. When some people talk about universal service. They don't always make the distinction between federal and state. <coughs> so the federal <coughs> USF, uh, the fund was established in 1997, but there were, since 1930, 1934, there were subsidies built into the system for high cost areas. It's it just that the fund itself wasn't codified until 1997. Um, the providers, uh, their contribution rate, their charge, changes quarterly to reflect the needs of the fund. And right now, the quarterly rate is 20%, and that's applied to interstate and international calls. And this gets to the issue of, for wireless services or for VoIP services, how do they keep track of what's an interstate call versus an intrastate call and that's kind of what I talked about earlier. There's a safe harbor provision. You can just say 65% of your calls of your revenue is international or interstate and will we'll pay 2% of that revenue. <coughs> There's no requirement that they pass on that cost to the customer, but they often do. You'll notice a federal charge on your phone bill for that portion of the so it's 20 percent is that does that mean two percent 20 percent 20 percent of the call it's not it's not what is it 20 percent of the of? revenue from international and interstate long distance telephone calls so if it costs a dollar to, to, to call somewhere 20 cents yep. is is the tax basically yep that's my understanding I, I, mostly <laughs> And then the federal programs uh, that are supported with the federal charge, there's the federal high cost support program, which has been transformed in the Connect, Connect America Fund, which is, you know, reflects the, uh, the policy change to build out broadband, not just voice. Um, low income support, like the federal lifeline program, which the state program supplements. And then there's the E-rate uh, discounts and subsidies for schools and libraries, and also for rural health care facilities. All right. Yep. Um, <coughs> the, so the, this federal USF, is this um, like the Connect America Fund, is that uh, you know, at FCC, or is this the USDA money, or is it, you know, how it's uh, how it's, who disperses it? Uh, there, yeah, uh, there's an entity, U, U, S, uh, AC, I can't remember, but there's an administrator hired by the FCC um, to collect the money, but it's basically an FCC program. So the money comes from the providers, comes from the phone bills, and that money goes into the programs. It's not a separate appropriation from a, a different program. But when we talk about, uh, you know, the rural broadband development money in the USDA budget, right? Is that separate? Is any of this money going into correct. there? I I'm, I don't know for sure. 
I don't know. So beyond these four programs, is any of this money collected going to support the other programs like right. the Farm Bill? And I can find that out. I, I don't know. Clay is shaking his head. No. Yeah. yeah. If you, I can answer that question. Is that right? Yeah. It is. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Clay Burvis for the record. Uh, the answer is no, that money comes from, uh, you know, the, the, the omnibus bill, you know, the budget, federal budget. Um, the Connect America Fund comes directly from the Universal Service charges on folks' phones. So they're very two separate company, or, uh, programs with two separate um, revenue streams. Is this an FCC program? Yes, it is an FCC program, um, and the fund is managed by the Universal Service Administrative Company. So they're hired by the FCC to collect all the money and then uh, administer these programs. Thank you. Any other questions? I have some, I know some things I'm going to look into, but anything else we can try to answer? Jeff, uh, for what it's worth, I know Jeff knows a lot about the, uh, the, the high cost programs from administering for a while. If you want to ask him while he's here, you can Great. Well, let's have Clay join us now. Okay. And um, thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Thank you, um, Sarah, do you want to um, check in with Representative Maslin and let him know that maybe we're more like quarter after 10. Okay. Oh, I see. I mean, I mean, okay. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you for having me. Just um, something that, uh, just thinking about the next, let's call it 45 minutes, what I'm hoping we can use our time on um, is for you to um, further expand our knowledge on uh, the, the uh, Vermont USF. Um, and I'm hoping you can also touch on, as we segue into some pool attachment discussion, um, just a, a high level overview of uh, the, um, the docket that you've opened with uh, the PUC. And I don't know to the extent you can talk about that, but um, at a high level. Um, we're going to talk about H93, um, and Re Representative Maslin and, uh, is going to introduce that bill, and Murray is going to talk to that to some extent as well after you're uh, done with your presentation. So I just wanted to kind of lay out what we're going to be talking okay. about, about here in the next 45 minutes, and, and you're joining us this morning is a, is a good segue into okay. some of those things. So, so just so I'm clear, uh, I should stay in my seat and <laughs> do this and then go on to the um, I do want to say I also invited our attorney who drafted the poll attachment rulemaking, so if okay. we have technical questions, um, she knows the rule inside and out. She's a very good resource. Her name is uh, Sarah Seves, and uh, she'll be joining us, I think, at 10. So um, so, I, uh, so my name is Clay Purvis. I'm the director for telecommunications and connectivity with the Department of Public Service. I uh, prepared a uh, high-level um, PowerPoint presentation just to go over the Kind of basics of the fund. Um, this presentation, uh, just based on the questions uh, I heard from Maria, or host Maria, may not answer all of your questions, but I'm happy to follow up with any additional information. Um, if I just scroll like this. Uh, so this is, uh, will cover a little bit of what um, uh, Maria already covered. Uh, the VUSF uh, is a 2% fee on your retail telecommunication services. Um, you can see this on your bill, uh, whether you have a, a mobile phone or a landline telephone, uh, you'll see that fee and what, what you pay. Um, it's collected from re at the retail level, so there's no collection on wholesale transactions, so um, transactions between telecommunications carriers are not subject uh, to the fee. The fund is managed by an independent fiscal agent, so the statute requires that we hire a fiscal agent, so we don't do any of the uh, work in-house. We don't do any of the collection or uh, the distribution of funds to the program. Um, Solix is a company based out of New Jersey, um, and they actually manage 
universal service funds and 911 funds for, I believe, 13 or 14 other states. So um, they are uh, one of the uh, preeminent companies in this field. And they do lots of other things uh, um, along with uh, in kind of in the same vein, uh, supporting telecom companies and uh, um, other state programs. Just before we leave that mm -hmm. slide, um, quickly, Clay, we had some discussion with Maria about, um, and there was some confusion, I'll speak for myself on my part, about um, if I have a, um, I have a, uh, a, a um, broadband provider that I get my telephone service through, the USF charge is applied to the proportion of my bill that is um, telecom related. So my, in this case, EC Fiber may apportion, I don't even know what it is, 20% of my bill to telephone services. So the USF uh, is applied to that portion of my bill. Is that how it would work? Yes. Okay. Um, and With, the, is there any auditing um, that uh, <coughs> confirms that yes, 20% of your bill um, should be ascribed to telecommunications services? Uh, certainly we have the, the power to audit um, individual carriers. Um, the, 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 I believe the way it works though is it's not just, because you, you have this issue with bundled packages. Mm -hmm. So yep. you just pay 100 bucks and you get three services. Um, but uh, carriers all have um, a, a retail catalog that breaks out individual services. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, and the, the, the cable franchise fee is calculated the same way. They take um, whatever the proportion of, they try to figure out what the proportion, what percentage of your bundle package would be if you bought each item separately. So. Um, if you're if the phone service plus the individual phone service plus the individual broadband service plus the individual cable service, um, you know, equals $99, so, um, and each one is 33, then they're going to charge you 2% on 33% of your bill, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was just trying to understand how much discretion the um, service provider had in saying, you know what, you're, you have your $100 bill. Telephone's only five dollars of that, so um, we're only going to um, collect the USF on that five dollars because that's what we've determined um, is the ascribed amount of telecommunication value in your package. But it's not that. It sounds like there is. Um, if they want to charge five dollars, as long as it's they're charging everyone five dollars and they're not changing the price. Yep. It for, they can change the price for the bundle package, but the, the fee is going to apply to whatever kind of the pro rata amount of that service by itself. So okay. 33, 33, 33, it's going to be one third um, of the bill is subject to the fee. Okay. Um, and the cable fran that issue comes up in uh, the cable franchise fee as well because uh, we impose a 5% cable franchise fee as we're allowed to under federal law on cable television service and with bundle packages it creates the same um, the same issue yeah. so okay. uh, there are rules of the road but if they did want to charge only five dollars for phone service then it would be two percent of five dollars yeah well it's got then to, to yeah. just quick and, and, and CLEC is that the cable um, CLEC right. is an acronym and I apologize, uh, I personally don't like acronyms, but there's a, there are many of them in this world. Um, I like is the uh, incumbent local exchange carrier. Right. So that. that's your consolidated in your Waitsfield, Champlain Valley. And then CLEC is a competitive local exchange okay. carrier. And these are terms of art that come from the Telecommunications Act, the federal act. So okay. um, uh, they have different regulatory treatments, so that's why we, we use them. Um, right. Okay. I just forgot what that meant. And so are the <coughs> are the uh, carriers required to justify the percentage of the uh, bundle packages that they apply to telecom versus the other things? Uh, what do you mean by justify? Well, I mean, uh, if they say only five percent or ten percent of my of the uh, bundle package is subject to the to the USF, um, who figured who? 
is it up to them to say what the percentage is? And does anybody check on that? Uh, does the Public Utility Commission take a look at it and say, well, you know, how do you come up with the 10%? Well, certainly, uh, <coughs> telecom is by and large deregulated, so we don't regulate rates anymore. So mm -hmm. they um, they are free to set the rates where they want. Uh, consolidated is under an incentive regulation plan, which um, I believe the best way to describe that is it sets a ceiling for what the rates are, and they can move the rates, um, uh, you know, anywhere under that ceiling. On the, on the federal end, the uh, the FCC often mandates a floor for telecommunications rates. So um, there is a, a baseline under which they can't they cannot go below. Uh, so the FCC is controlling both the the kind of the rate base and I guess you call it the mill rate the the actual charge. Um, as a way to maintain um, revenues and budget for future uh, revenues. But, I mean, to put a finer point on it, and I think Mike and I are kind of asking the same question, the discretion of the service provider determines how much tax um, is collected from the consumer. Yes. And that discretion, um, the service provider may decide um, ascribing less value um, to a particular bundled service, um, and that discretion, uh, that decision made by the service provider has a direct impact on the revenue that the state collects on the USF. Correct. So that's a lot of discretion um, in the hands of the service provider as opposed to the hands of the regulator. Yes. Um, but again, our ability to regulate rates, and you know, wireless is a big part of that because we are expressly preempted by the Telecommunications Act from regulating yep. wireless rates. So to the extent that they're regulated at all, it's at the FCC level. And we are seeing people cutting the cord, moving to wireless, and at the same time we're seeing a decline in uh, wireless voice revenues. Um, yep. It's a competitive market, they're competing for customers, they're lowering that. Um, and, and voice is also becoming a smaller component of the overall package. It's all about data. Now people want data, um, so the, the voice is almost an afterthought. Yeah. Especially if you talk to uh, teenagers, you know, they're texting, they're not. Try calling one of them on the phone and they're not going to pick up. Um, so it, it's certainly a, a trend that is having uh, downward pressure on, on the USF. Um, so the supported programs, this is an order, so there's an order of priority, and uh, I believe Maria touched on this, but the fiscal agent gets paid first, um, then we move, yep, always, always first. Uh, then we move to the Vermont Lifeline program, so this is on top of the federal credit, so Lifeline eligible consumers get a federal credit, which I believe is nine dollars and twenty-five cents, and then we have a credit on uh, the state level, which is an additional. Uh, it's capped at four dollars and twenty-five cents, um, which can be applied to a telephone bill. The difference between our Lifeline program and the federal Lifeline program is that we only fund wireline telephone service, uh, so. If you buy telephone service from an eligible telecommunications um, carrier or an ETC, um, they have to be a wireline. So we're not supporting, um, you know, the the life the mobile lifeline, the track phones, and the uh, Q-Link. But those services are generally priced at the same uh, at, at nine twenty five. So the federal credit covers. 100% of the mobile, so that's why we've chosen as a state to only support wire, or wireline telephone service. Um, telephone relay service, this is communication services for the deaf and hard of hearing, and that includes the equipment distribution program, so uh, the service uh, the contractor for that program is Sprint, and uh, if you utilize that service, you can um, uh, make a phone call and 
uh, a technician at Sprint will relay that call uh, through video using sign language. Um, $75,000 a year is devoted to equipment distribution. So this is to purchase equipment that would be used to access uh, relay services or uh, TTY services. Uh, 911, enhanced 911, so that's uh, set by the, the budget, the big bill, um, and we pay 12 equal payments uh, to the state treasurer uh, to support 911. And then anything that's left over goes into the connectivity fund, and I'll talk about distributions in a moment. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, last year, we, uh, as part of telecommunications, but we, we asked for a study on um, the need for helping people who are both visually and hearing impaired. Yeah. Um, I know you're probably not including that here, but is that study being, has it, has it been done? Yes. It has, okay. And you report that to us at some point? Um, I sum we submitted it to the uh, to legislative council. I'm happy to come back and discuss the findings in that report. Um, but that yeah, that's not included here uh, because it's not a service that's yet supported. Um, uh, I know the uh, relay service used to do just type out like s straight text, which presumably is less expensive than video conferencing. They also had uh, braille versions of uh, keyboard and, and monitor. Do they still use that, or is it all switched to uh, the, the video? Uh, that equipment is still available to the extent uh, folks are using that in favor of, or over newer technologies. Certainly for deaf and hard of hearing, um, there are there have been great advancements in computer technology. Um, deaf deaf-blind folks um, um, still, uh, I think there's still a need there to uh, make technology available um, for that. But this program hasn't actually been updated to kind of take into account computer equipment and information technologies that could be, that could assist. Um, it is still largely uh, telecommunications um, equipment that uh, has traditionally been used in that service. There's a chart of um, revenues and expenses from 2014 to 2018. That's the time frame in which we've managed the fund, and uh, Solix has been the, um, the, uh, the fiscal agent for the fund. Um, you can see uh, there, there's a trend developing. Uh, revenues are declining. Expenses are also declining, but not quite at the same rate. So is there, is there a, uh, maybe this is in a future slide, it looks like just in this five-year period, there's about a $2 million surplus? Um, just looking at the, the revenues exceeding expenses. Yes. Um, what happens to that surplus? It goes to the connectivity fund. Okay. The 200000 but it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually 500,000. I believe in 2015 was our, our greatest, um, yeah, and that, that went to the connectivity fund. Um, that we had, I think, 1.9 million. I'm just uh, adding up yeah. the surpluses over five years. It's like around two million dollars. Yeah, or yes, it's, um, there have been surpluses, and when you add them together, um, you know, that would be the, the connectivity fund distribution. By and large, some of it was left in the fund as a cushion, so um, we certainly don't want to sweep every single dollar out of the fund because then when you have, um, it, you know, it creates cash flow plot problems as you uh, go from month to month. We have some carriers that pay on a monthly basis and some that pay on a quarterly basis. Uh, so. Every, at the end of every quarter, you, you, we receive a, um, a larger uh, amount of, of revenue than we would in the off-quarter months. All right, 
and this is disbursements for FY18. Uh, you can see that 911 makes up the bulk of the fund. Um, relay and Lifeline and uh, Administrative make up the rest. Uh, relay includes the Equipment Distribution Fund, so um, that would be a maximum of 75, but of course, Section 2018 we saw um, significantly less come out of that fund um, due to a contracting issue that has since been resolved, so we expect that number to be a little bit bigger this year. So uh, where's the connectivity fund slice it's, of the pie there? It's excluded from this. And the reason I excluded uh, the connectivity fund from this is because the way the connectivity fund is funded is that the fiscal agent is required by law to wait till the end of the fiscal year. So the end of 2018, um, they close out the books. And in September, they make a sweep of basically whatever the surplus is in the fund at the end of the year into the connectivity fund. So it's not budgeted for so much as it's just whatever's left at the end of the year goes into the separate fund. Is there a percentage roughly that it ends up being of the total every, every year for the connectivity fund? Uh, yes, I have a slide on that right here. You can see the, the distributions that have gone from the uh, the VUSF into the connectivity fund. So 2015, it was nearly $2 million that was swept into the fund. That was by and large because of a, a buildup of cash in the fund. 2016 was just over a million. And you can see it's steadily declining. Last year, the fiscal agent um, determined that uh, there was no, that no money should be transferred to the uh, connectivity initiative. This year? This year, yeah. Going back to your slide five, um, where we left off, uh, obviously a huge amount of this goes to E911. Is that, um, how discretionary is that going into the fiscal year? Um, in the budget, is there an E91 line item? Yes. And um, if uh, if this fund, for example, in this year raised uh, $6 million, the $4.8 million would still be a fixed amount that would go to E911? Yes. Uh, the uh, 911 budget is determined through the regular budgeting pr pro uh, process, just like any other state agency. Okay. So, um, you know, they create a budget roll up and it you know, gets decided with some appropriations and ways and means and um, just, you know, goes through that regular process. So, um, we talk with E911 over the summer and find out what their plans are for their forthcoming budget. I believe agencies submit in September, October, you know, kind of the beginning of fall. Um, and so we, we know going into the new year kind of what we're going to budget for. Um, in the past few years, I believe it's been level funded. Yeah. And I, oh. yeah, so just to confirm your. So this year, in terms of the connectivity um, the initiative, no money? Yes, we, we have an RFP out right now for the money we have received last year. Right. That's 220000 yeah. And this year, we have none. So that means no high cost money, no, um, no connectivity initiative money coming from the VUSF. So can I ask another question here? Mm -hmm. um, so do you, are you doing any projections going forward? I mean, you know, so we're obviously on a downward trajectory. So in terms of the USF and the uses of the USF. Yeah, it's so, uh, yes, that's something the fiscal agent has uh, worked on. And the budget that I've provided to you um, has, uh, that, that would be the FY19 uh, budget that, we, uh, that the fiscal agent created and they've actually added um, tabs within that workbook 
that show what the projected revenues would be at different rates of 2, 2.1, 2, and so on and so forth. Okay. I, I mean, I, and I don't want to get into this right now, but just to comment and say that you know we do have uh, we do have a proposal to raise the USF, and you know I'm just wondering with some intention about what that might be used for. But if we're like you know heading, we, we're having a hard time covering what it's paying for now. I think that might be a you know, additional discussion, or we're going to be. There are, there are a lot of different items up in the air, so Lifeline is, is one area where we are seeing a decline in Lifeline usage, and it's a program that's actually very underutilized mm -hmm. in Vermont, so everyone who, if everyone who is eligible for Lifeline applied for Lifeline, um, th that would have a significant impact on, uh, on the fund's uh, sustainability. If but everyone the, that was eligible applied for it, it would have a significant impact on the fund. Is that what you just said? Yes, but we're actually seeing the lifeline numbers declining, not increasing. So, um, so excuse me, Clay. So, of the various uses of the USF money, the only one that is <coughs> a budgeted amount is E911. The rest are sort of as applications come in or need based need based correct right. yes so it actually makes it difficult to budget for lifeline because an increase in lifeline applications would increase the pressure on on the fund yeah and and vice versa actually due to federal changes uh, in the federal lifeline program uh, we've seen a decline in uh, lifeline users in the state. So, uh, that's having, kind of, well, I don't want to say a positive impact on the fund, but it's, it's um, but you know what I mean. It's relieving it's, pressure. It's relieving pressure on, on, on the fund. Um, um, the, you know, the other, co the other budgeted item is the administrative cost. We generally know what that's going to be. That's in, co in a contract. The fiscal agent charges about $73,000 a year, and then we have bank fees, which are pretty, fairly predictable. So, um, you know, the total admin for 2019, we're looking here, is, is going to be about, um, uh, sorry, about oh, red. Um, 180, 186, yeah. Um, Our interest, 186, right? Yeah, 107. Yeah, 107, thank you. So, it's a little oh, bit confusing yeah. the way it's written there, but yeah, yeah 107. So, um, you know, that's predictable, but that's such a small portion of the fund. And the equipment distribution, since it's capped at 75, that's a budgeted item as well. So, Lifeline and TRS are the two areas where um, the fund can fluctuate. Um, but we've seen downward trajectory on both items. Yeah. If there is a surplus projected, and the um, projected transfer to the connectivity fund is zero. What happens to that surplus? Uh, it stays in the VUSF to manage as a, as a precaution against um, changes in revenue. So uh, there, there wasn't, and I've provided you the audited financials for last year, so I don't have those up, but <coughs> they're certainly um, at your disposal. And you can see there was um, about a half a million dollars uh, surplus in the fund um, at the end of the year, but it was the fiscal agents uh, concerned that uh, that this trend um, uh, would um, affect cash flows. And the long-term sustainability of the fund is certainly on their mind. So, so they determined that a certain level of reserve is necessary to keep in the fund. Yes. covered that slide. And so the connectivity fund, um, just to go over the basics, um, the connectivity fund supports two programs, the high cost program and the connectivity initiative. 
The high cost program provides support to eligible telecommunications carriers, those are VETCs. Uh, those are by and large your incumbent telephone companies. And there's a process by which they get certified by the PUC to uh, become incumbent or to become VETCs. Uh, so I think we have about seven in the state and um, of the money that is um, um, attributed to or that is uh, put into the high cost program, they take a pro rata share based on either eligible service locations or um, lines in service, whatever's greater. Eligible locations are locations deemed to be high cost. A, there's a, uh, a mechanism for that, and the PUC had a docket to determine uh, which telephone exchanges uh, were considered high cost. Uh, the Connectivity Initiative is the second program. <coughs> this receives 55% of that funding, so 45 to high cost, 55 to the Connectivity Fund, um, or the, excuse me, the Connectivity Initiative. Uh, this is a grant program that funds last mile broadband expansion. So my department maps broadband availability. We ask broadband providers to tell us where they have broadband service and where they do not. And we produce a map that then um, grantees can um, uh, submit proposals to the department uh, that uh, seeking to serve uh, eligible locations. So this process is laid out in state statute and we're required to issue um, or solicit proposals from carriers at least once a year uh, using the money that we receive in the uh, connectivity fund for this program. Um, very briefly, 10,000, 50,000 foot view. Um, <coughs> eligibility is determined by census block, is that correct? That is the language in the statute um, in I, to, to give effect to that, we certainly kind of look at the locations by census block, but it's actually much easier to look at it on an address by address basis. So um, we can be far more precise than at the census block level. And actually, you know, there's so many what we call contaminated census blocks. Those are census blocks that are partially served and then partially unserved. And we want to make sure. We want to make sure that those partially unserved census blocks, that the addresses within those blocks are getting served, are getting priority over the addresses that are served. So um, because providers can give us data on an address by address location, our map actually, you can, you can zoom in on um, any particular location and see you know, which houses are unserved and which houses are served. And so you're not necessarily constrained by the definition of an unserved census block or restricted, um, prohibited from allocating funds in yeah. something that's designated as, a, as served if it's half unserved. That, that's yes, we do, not, <laughs> we do not believe that we are constrained uh, by that. and. I, actually, the, at least for the first few years of this program, we were very concerned about the contaminated census blocks because the FCC wasn't. So in the Connect America Fund program, they excluded contaminated census blocks because it's just so hard to kind of differentiate between who served and not served. So there were plenty of addresses in wholly unserved census blocks that they the FCC designated Connect America funds for those blocks, leaving the contaminated census blocks with no no publicly funded solution. Um, so we thought that the connectivity initiative could really fill in the gap where uh, the Connect America fund uh, and that, and frankly, USDA programs uh, weren't going. Do you have questions, Scott? Yes. I have a couple of questions, and I'm trying to figure out which one to ask. Maybe I'll ask the easy one, and that is, so this is a, a, a grant program for 
provider for uh, service providers that they, can, that they can bid for, and what portion of the cost of the of whatever cost they are estimating to, to provide connectivity does the grant cover? So the grant covers uh, the infrastructure costs, so the actual cost of deploying broadband. So we're not subsidizing operations. The uh, the statute so it covers 100% of, of that. It can't. It yeah. can't. Yeah. Uh, the statute directs us to prioritize projects with the lowest cost per address. So when we get a list of when we get a, a group of proposals, what we do is. We put them in a spreadsheet based on cost and see which ones are at the top. And the law requires us to favor those, but then it gives us some leeway to look at technology, um, cost to the consumers. So maybe there's a, a low cost service that uh, um, might, even though the, the, the the cost to the grant program is more. Maybe it's just a better option for consumers. So there is um, there is some leeway uh, in the statute for us to kind of make decisions based on whether you know is this a better technology? You know, perhaps we should be paying more for uh, broadband that can provide higher speeds, um, like fiber. So and if if a, if a provider. Um saw an area where they were interested in, in, in providing service, they might they might request less than 100% of uh, the cost of building it out yes. for a grant, so that might make it more attractive to get funded. Yes, so and, like, uh, as an and example, uh, Waitsfield, Champlain Valley Telecom did that. They actually asked for a very small percentage of the overall project okay. build. Yes, thank you. But it's not the sole determiner, so mm -hmm. certainly if there was a good project and we had to pay 100% for it, we would consider that. So this graph shows the uh, distributions to the uh, connectivity fund. And so these numbers that you see here would be split 45, 55%, except for the year 2015 when the law was an even split. Law was changed in 2016 to 45.55. And I have one last slide on fund trends. We're seeing a decline in accessible revenue. This is a, we're seeing declines in uh, phone, telephone rates, so the amount of money that telephone carriers are charging. Shifts from regulated to non-regulated revenues. People are favoring information services over telecom services. So, where folks used to have a mobile phone and a landline phone, they're cutting their landline phone. They're, they're down to one phone. Um, prepaid calling legislation. Uh, Maria Royal touched on this. This is um, going to have a small but noticeable impact to the fund. Um, we're thinking somewhere between. Possibly four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year. This only affects prepaid calling cards, so not all prepaid plans. Only only cards sold in stores. So most consumers, when they use prepaid, they'll buy a prepaid card once. They'll go to Walmart, they'll buy the card. They'll come home, they'll activate the card. Under existing state law, once that card is activated and it's determined that the location of the user is within the state of Vermont, the carrier remits payment to the USF. Once that consumer is established, they generally re-up that card directly with the, the carrier. So at that point, the carrier is direct making that direct transaction. And that direct transaction between the consumer and the carrier is not the subject of the federal legislation, only the cards purchased um, at the store. So once the consumer is kind of in the door and they're just re-upping their service directly with the provider, uh, this federal law doesn't touch those revenues. Can I just clarify? Uh, so I just want to clarify that you said we're going to have a four to $600,000 hole 
um, because of the prepaid, which I think you called small. Yes. So what percentage um, drop in the, um, is that? You're asking me to, to do math on the spot. <laughs> you know, I'll um, take I'll take some pretty round numbers to play, and I bet. Well, you I I brought this thing, and it has a calculator on it. Um, <laughs> so we'll just give you. Let's say uh, we had five, eight, fifteen, all right, um, uh, How did we figure this out? Is it? Not it's, Six hundred thousand seven by five point six million. Yes, thank you. There's a reason I went to law school. So I think I think Susan the head nerd has figured it out yeah. for us. Oh, um, thank you. He's <laughs> really good. At it. <laughs> so um, we're going to take um, Representative Maslin has joined us, and we're going to hold questions. Um, Representative Maslin is going to join us to um, do a presentation or an introduction of H93. Clay, if you can stick around, because we're, we're going to ask you to come back and, and actually refer to this. Um,